weaving's really old, and all these stories, a lot of them deal with their creation stories. So they're really important in cultures. Every culture is, you know, from, um, I mean, you can look at Greek ones, African ones, Native American ones. We're going to go through a bunch where they're um, weaving takes part not only as part of the culture, um, becoming established, it's a big part of um, developing culture and arts within um, a society, but it was also huge in their storytelling. And a lot of them also included weaving um, in um, their creation stories. It also makes connections between us weaving and those before us, which I think is super fascinating. Um, and anytime we kind of do that, we kind of enrich what we're doing and we make things deeper um, and just, um, yeah, make things more exciting. And um, it, I think it allows us as weavers to bring in other fellow artists. Um, doesn't matter what the field is, you get this opportunity to invite other people in to our work in different ways by relating it to um, somebody else's field just kind of opening it up and um, talking about it. So stories and images, I think, are one of those powerful things that stick with you. Um, this image has totally stuck with me forever. And um, it is um, from the Lady of Shalat. Am I saying that right? I'm going to say them all wrong. Um, and we'll talk about her in a little bit. But images and things totally stick with us. Stories stick with us. We remember stories. Um, they're passed down, they make an impression, and then we also have, it's the same thing with weaving. Do you have, I think we all could identify weavings that we've seen that have completely stuck with us, like made us try something new, explore something new, um, want to check it out. There's also this huge connection between literature and weaving. You have all these borrowed phrases. Can anybody think of one? There's a few there. Weavings of life, thread of light, a twist of fate, um, what's another one? Weaving a story. You have these poetic forms that are constantly borrowing these terms back and forth. Tangled um, web. Tangled web. Yeah, tangled web. Yep. Cobwebs are often used. Like, oh, she's got. You know, you've got cobwebs in your brain. You know, and that has to do with weaving and all these different things through history. Um, so I think there is these really cool connections between literature and um, weaving. And again, I'm not an English person, so I don't know a ton about that, but I think it's totally fascinating. You're doing a beautiful job. Thanks. Um, so Greek and Roman ones, um, this I think is super crazy. You had these fates, okay, and they aren't weavers, but they're spinners, so this one is um, whatever, but it talks about the power that these fibers had in the stories of their culture, in the webs that were woven throughout um, the history and just what um, the people, you know, what was important, what was going on, what was controlling things. So they had the three fates, um, and the first one would select the material and spin it. So you not only have this super powerful person who's going to, you know, select how strong this is going to be, how, you know, what material it is, and start spinning it, um, and it could be spun at different ways, but then the, you have the next one who measures the length of the thread. So weaving and spinning were not only associated with creation of life, but also the very end, you have the last fate who cuts it and determines the end. And you see this over and over in these patterns where the weavers um, not only created the different um, aspects within that culture, but they could also destroy it. They could stop weaving, they could start unraveling something, they could finish it and start cutting it off. So it was this, um, you know, they had the timeline of what was going on, and it was in the hands of the weavers and the spinners, which I think is super, super fascinating. Um, and so the first one that we'll look at, um, do you guys know the story of arachnids? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know arachnids and the, the whole naming process behind spiders. Um, there's about three different versions of this story, so they all kind of end in the same way, but how she gets there is slightly different. But if you don't know it, um, Arachne was mortal, and she loved to weave everything. Beautiful, beautiful weaving. And um, she got so full of herself that she challenged Athena. Okay, and just to refresh her memories, Athena was 
the goddess of all wisdom and crafts. Okay, so Arachne was pretty darn full of herself to go ahead and challenge the weaver of crafts and wisdom. Um, and so <laughs> they challenge each other. And um, of course, um, Athena, they both weave these gorgeous weavings. Um, and Athena still cannot be trumped, but she sees the passion within Arachne, like this is what she does, this is, she can't continue without weaving. Um, and this is where the story takes different turns, as in how she becomes a spider, if she kills herself because she knows she won't be able to weave anymore, and then she gets turned into a spider, or if Athena turns her into a spider first, because she knows that she won't be able to survive without spin, you know, weaving these webs. So, um, but, so that's one of the most, I think, well-known ones. And then we will see another connection with another culture with spiders also, um, and they're weaving. But this is one of the, the older ones, and again, a huge um, theme through Greek, um, which we call it. Um, and then we have some more Greek examples. You have Helen in the um, Iliad, and she, while she's not known for weaving, weaving, she's in the story weaving, and it's as a picture of um, her discipline, her work ethic, and her attention to um, detail and all these important things. And you also have um, Ovid and the tale of, I'm gonna say her name wrong, um, Philomalvi, I can't say it, oh my goodness. Um, I tried to like look them up too to find somewhere to like pronounce the words, couldn't find it. Um, you have the tale of Ovid, and while it's a more, like, horrible tale, you have this sister whose husband commits this horrendous rape of this woman. And it, this, is, this is a big Greek um, epic. Um, and to cover his, his um, tale, he cuts out her tongue. And so she has no tongue, she has no way to tell her story, um, no way to whatever. And so what, what she does, and I'm sorry I can't say her name, I'll email it out. Um, she uses her loom as her voice. And she weaves um, what happened on the loom. And her sisters and all of them totally get it, and they take revenge and boil him and behead him. So justice happened <laughs> through, through the image of the loom. Um, what's that? Right? Yeah. So um, yeah, but she uses the loom as this great means of communication, and um, I just think it's fascinating that it becomes this. Whatever, as horrible as the story is. Um, it's You're in this bit better watch it. <laughs> um, so yeah, and there's there's a few um, you know, and I think this is one of those things where there's a few really neat fiber artists that totally use um, we see it now as in fiber artists using their medium to promote different messages and um, there's one other culture that really uses um, their weaving um, which we'll call it, creation person to promote justice also, and we'll look at that. The next one is also a Greek Roman tale, um, and this one I'm really close to because I have a Penelope, but this is Penelope um, in the Homer's Odyssey, and um, what happens here is Penelope um, is the wife of Odysseus, and he is off at war. Um, she is captured, and they want to, um, they all want to woo her and marry her, and she goes, not till I'm done weaving my shroud. And she just knows her husband is coming back for her. And so she weaves all day and all day and all day, and then all night again, she unweaves. Um, so she never finishes the morning shroud until her husband does return and they um, are reunited again. So, but you have again the theme of these weavers kind of having control over their destiny in these stories by the fact that She's um, kind of creating this, you know, power for herself through her loom of um, weaving and then being able to keep the constraints by on weaving at night. So it's, I find that place so interesting of this creation and then on doing it and then whatever. So, you know, when you're on weaving your loom, you can just think about these things. You know, you never regret on weaving, right? So um, you can think of Penelope for seven years. Oh, on weaving at her loom. Yeah. So the next one is Egyptian. Um, and I think this is really crazy. So Egyptian culture is one of the few ancient cultures where this was only the men who wove. I mean, um, so the women weren't the ones weaving in ancient, ancient um, 
Egypt, but yet the goddess of weaving and whatnot, um, Nef or Neef, I have no idea how to say that one either, um, she is a woman. She is not only the goddess of weaving, but she's the goddess of war and hunting. Um, again, an extremely bizarre combination. Um, not one you would shrink at. And um, so, but um, she was said to reweave the world every day on her loom. When she would, whatever, she would reweave the creation of, of you know, the nature elements and whatnot with what, with what she had. And um, so, and then the next slide, I think, um, yeah, these are the symbols of her. So if you were to, you know, be at the Met in the Egyptian wing or whatnot, she has three, um, I forget what they're called, they're not hieroglyphics, but the glyphs, thank you, the glyphs um, of her, because she's the goddess of those three things. The last one is her with a weaving shuttle on her head. Um, so you have the war and the hunting and then the weaving. And then um, the last one is a hieroglyph for loom, okay? And um, the words that have to do with weaving um, are very similar to the words that um, are connected with creation and being, um, that you would be creating and um, be bringing being or um, things coming forth while using the loom. So, her story is really interesting. She has like this huge encompassing role, half of which involves weaving and half of which doesn't at all. So really, really interesting. But again, just the fact that each of these major cultures has this deep within their history, I think is super, super fascinating. The next one is um, Asian cultures. Um, so this one is shared by a few Asian cultures. Does anybody know the story of the crane girl? or the crane wife. Um, this is super fascinating to me. Um, and if you go to the library, you can actually find little children's folk tale books about it. Um, so we'll tell it by the crane girl, because that's the one I like better. Um, the crane <coughs> wife one is a little odd. I use the same thing, but different um, character, different, um, it's either girl or wife. So what happens is there is um, a crane who is stuck in some kind of trap, and these, these people come and rescue the crane and let it free, and show mercy on the crane. And the crane is so grateful, it disguises itself, we'll use the girl story, as a girl, and returns to the couple who released it. Um, the couple is very poor, um, and this is the Japanese version. Um, the couple is very poor, and um, the girl comes and has nowhere to go, is you know orphaned or whatnot. So the couple take her in even though they can't afford to do so. So again, they show her mercy this second time. So she, to help them, starts um, weaving. She goes, well, I can make a weaving for you, and you can then sell it, so we can, so you guys can eat. You know, it was that desperate. So she goes, but you cannot watch me while I weave. That was the big secret. So disguise herself, then goes into the weaving studio and starts weaving, you know, as her crane self, um, and then comes forth with these spectacular weavings. And they have this glittery, airy lightness, um, and they're just beautiful. And no one can figure out how these weavings are produced. They're just going, what kind of yarn is this? What kind of whatever? And it fetches just this great price, so they're able to eat. Well, then they get in the whatever, so she weaves them yet another one. And again, you know, don't watch me weave, don't watch me weave. So the third time that it comes up, she's weaving again. Um, and again, each weaving has been successively more beautiful and more beautiful. And she's weaving away, and they can't, the couple can't resist it. They have to go look. Um, and they peek in, and they realize that she is the crane, and she's in this pitiful state. She's been using her own feathers to insert into the weavings. And so the crane is just, you know, devastated and is in this horrible state and has to leave them then. Um, but you have this story again that uses weaving to help whatnot. But um, it's very interesting that it's a crane. I don't know what the significance of that is. And the wife one I just don't like, because I'm like, how can you get married to a crane? 
Yeah. <laughs> and not know it. Um, so that's why I like the girl one a lot better. Um, but yeah, fascinating tales. So these are, um, you know, tales that are passed down orally that I think make just a huge impact. And we just remember these stories. Um, and I think we can do that when we talk about our weaving, that people remember stories really well. Um, so to do that with, sometimes with our weaving is great. The next one is um, um, Chinese, and there's also a, a Korean version of this. There is um, the weaver goddess and the herdsman. Does anybody know the story behind the um, Valentine's Day in China? It is when two stars, it has to do with the lunar calendar, um, cross or almost appear to be touching. And the story behind it has to do with um, the weaver goddess and herdsman. So there was a weaver goddess, and she was so into her weaving, you guys can't you know, believe this, she, nothing else mattered. You know, she, um, everything else was left, it was going to waste, it was whatever, and so, um, the father who, you know, the god who was her father was just like, we have to do something about this. You know, maybe, I know, I need someone to fall in love with her. That's exactly what needs to happen. She needs to love interest. Yes, there needs to be a triangle between weaving and uh, whatnot. So he, um, she is sent down to the earth to this mortal who um, is just this herdsman. Um, and he thinks, oh, this will be great. You know, this will whatever. So, but has all good fatherly plans off to go sometimes. Um, it doesn't go quite as planned. She does fall completely in love with this herdman, but to the point where now she can't do anything else um, again. So she's completely oblivious to everything else. Um, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so, but he ignores his tasks. She has ignored hers. Um, and he is so upset that he divides them by the Milky Way. And, um, and then once a year, all the magpie and, and ravens come and make a bridge for them to meet. And they're also attributed to the two stars, and I don't remember Constellation? What yeah, the constellations. Okay. Um, to the two constellations, and when they look like they're touching, or when they get closer together, um, that date on the lunar calendar is how that date is established in their calendar as the Valentine's Day to these two people to meet that were divided. Super interesting. The only other really cool story, and I think we can see this even now in Asian weaving, is this, um, this pursuit of perfection um, and different wholeness to their cloth, um, as in not cutting it and not wanting seams. Um, you have in the Tang Dynasty a story of a weaver coming down on, you know, some kind of fancy shaft of moonlight, and um, she has her princess robe that she has woven, and there's not one seam in it. It is completely woven on the loom, and um, they have well, a common, I mean, I don't know how common it is, but um, through my reading that one of the a phrase that they use often is the goddess's robe is seamless and it's to just um, use to talk about perfect workmanship and um, having a cohesive plan and whatnot but I've seen that a lot even now people who study Japanese and weavings from China how their kimonos are these one full whole piece of cloth that are woven just to the T you know there are there's no putting together or cutting up of all these things. And you see that in the rest of their culture too with origami, you have this one piece of paper that's gonna be folded up and not cut. Um, super, really weird. Um, the next one is Native American ones. And this one, you guys familiar with Spider Woman? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so this one I thought we would know. Um, or Spider Grandmother, whatever um, her name might, might be. This, so, and if you look at the history of where weaving came from then, there's a lot of different historical things where it could have come from pre-Columbian times in Mexico and um, lots of different history type traits in here. But a lot of them use the spider, um, which makes sense because a lot of them, 
a lot of historians will attribute the fact that cultures probably looked to nature to find out different ways to do you know weaving and finding materials and whatnot um, and seeing the patterns in spider webs but her first loom was said to be the sky and the earth that she wove those things together um, and then in further tales she becomes the teacher of weaving to all those cultures and the next one I think has some pictures I mean it was hard to find pictures when you like look for you type in spider woman and uh, x men or whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so but and they're I don't know how prevalent it is still in their cultures but if that if a child is born and they are within a family that does weaving or wants weaving, that infant will have spider webs just rubbed all over their hands um, as a child to hopefully promote this good weaving. Um, there are piles of stories, and you guys probably know more than I do, because um, a lot of you are very familiar with Navajo weaving and different things, behind um, with um, their culture and this guy. It's kind of like in the African Tales you have um, Anzi, Anis, or how do you say it? Anzi, the spider? Yeah, who's a trickster, but also really smart, and so it's a spider that can do all these things. It's the same kind. There are some tales like that too, um, where, the, and they're also, this spider was extremely concerned with justice within the community also, which I found repeatedly through looking into it. Um, Lots and lots of stories about how how it used different um, different ways of how it used nature and weaving to promote justice within the culture. Um, yeah, and okay, so also in the spider in the Native Americans, she's the one who wove the web and threw it up and made the stars in the sky. You know, so all those stories have to do with the weaving too, which I think is super cool. Um, the last one, this is a more recent one, um, or the most modern one out of the whole group, is um, seeing weaving in poetry. And I think we see weaving all the time in poetry through the vocabulary. It just, it fits. Um, you know, you have these threads of things weaving in and out of these stories, and, and it's almost like you can't separate the two when people are talking about it. Even if they don't understand technically weaving, they still can use the vocabulary when talking about um, songs or stories or whatnot. So, um, if you're not familiar with this poem, it's really great. It's not super long. Um, but the story behind, does anybody know it? Kind of. Yeah, the story behind it is she is casting this tower. Camelot is nearby. And a lot of you, like, I, got, I became familiar with this through Anne Green Gables. Okay, so if you've read Anne Green Gables or seen the movie, you know, she dramatically plays, plays out the boat scene the shawl on her and then the boat fills up with water. Um, so anyway, but she's reenacting this poem. Um, the poem, she is in the tower, um, the Lady of Shalott, and then she sees Camelot, but she is cursed to not leave the tower or look at it with her own eyes. She can only view the um, Camelot and Sir Lancelot through a mirror. And so she's weaving through this mirror um, the whole time and can't look out the window and she just is ready to lose it like she can't take it anymore and so I wonder why <laughs> um, so anyway she breaks the curse and she finally looks out the window and immediately the curse um, on her starts she was cursed to die if she did you know and died lonely without being rescued from the tower and her weaving immediately starts becoming this unraveled tangled mess and so she leaves the tower and goes into this boat and floats down towards Camelot. And of course, Sir Lancelot sees her like as this dying person in a boat instead of rescuing her. But um, the whole <laughs> very tragic. Um, the, the whole story um, to me is fascinating because again, um, the weaving part of it controlled her you know, gave her this power or not over her life and her destiny. I mean, she chose to end it, tragically. Um, but the artwork behind that poem is just so
super fascinating. There are piles of it. Um, yeah, these, I mean, this one and this one and then the one at the very beginning. Um, and every single one, there's a different loom picture, a different type of loom, a different type of um, weaving going on. And um, a lot of people who are, who read um, a lot of classic literature and poetry are going to be familiar with this. So, um, yeah, but I think it's super fascinating when we can connect our work to things that are beyond our work and then also within histories and cultures and whatnot. Does anybody have any other examples that they've thought of while we've, whatever? Just names, people's last names, surnames are have always fascinated me, like Weaver and Webster. Yeah, and absolutely. Fire. And I think it totally had to do with what they did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was a there's a road that I'll pass all the time through Amish country and it, they would have names like the Basket Weaver Road and then, you know, the Blanket Weaver. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 